Today I try and fit as many different pickle puns into a single video as I can, and maybe make a drink or two. So join me as we find out what's the deal with pickles? No, but seriously, there's a lot of puns in this video and they don't get any better. Roll credits! Now, you might be asking yourself, why a masterclass on pickles and how that relates to cocktails at all? Well, first, let's correct any misunderstandings we might have about what we mean by pickles. We're talking about pickling, e.g. the process of taking something, e.g. a vegetable, uh, most commonly a cucumber, um, and pickling it, either through a brine or through a process known as lacto-fermentation. Why and how we would make a whole masterclass on this? Well, pickles are a great addition to cocktails. Uh, they not only make for a really tasty garnish on most drinks, uh, but the brine used to uh, ferment them or pickle them uh, can make a, a nice additional liquid into a cocktail which can enhance the flavour of drinks. And let's not forget the process of pickling is a way of preservation. So it can help literally help us preserve ingredients and, and, and enhance the flavour of those ingredients, take them from something quite simple into something quite complex. Take shrubs for example, they are quite literally a pickling process when you think about them. You're just taking an ingredient, some sugar and some vinegar, sitting them together to create a new ingredient uh, that you can use in a cocktail. And also the reason we're doing this masterclass, guys is thanks to the very credible source of Google. Apparently today is National Pickle Day in the USA. We are actually currently filming this on election results day or what would be election results day. I don't know what the results were quite now. Um, so I'd either like to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden, and thank you America for making the right decision. If it's the other way, let's just not talk about it and hope the next four years go by as quickly as possible. But this also means we get to introduce you, introduce you to one of the greatest shots ever created in a bar and served around the world today, and one of my personal favorite shots to take in a bar, the pickleback. But I'm not gonna talk about that right now, I'm gonna save that for the mid uh, masterclass where we talk about a classic, because that's what we're gonna be making this week, guys. Which, by the way, I'm gonna say it, every week until the numbers get up. It's only four pounds, add it to your box. You will not get a, ch a cocktail cheaper than that anywhere, nowhere. Now, you might ask yourself, how does a pickle celebrate their name day? Well, they relish it. That was funny. That was actually, that was very good. <laughs> <laughs> right, on to our first drink. And today, first up, we have one of my all time favorite cocktails from the history of doctoring's menus. It's delicious to drink and it's simple to make. We have the two amounts. As always, let's make the drink and then I'll ramble on a little bit about it. As like my parents used to say, the more we drink, Jacob, the more interesting you start to sound. For this drink, guys, you're going to be serving it in a martini glass or if you want to be super authentic, a Hendrix teacup and saucer. Uh, these are usually pretty easy to get your hands on, guys. If you head down to your local supermarché, you'll be able to pick one up in a little Hendrix package. Uh, they usually come with a little teacup and saucer set, as that was the drink, that was the vessel that we served it in originally in Dr. Inks. Um, and it's going to be a stirred down drink, guys, so you're going to need a mixing glass. I've currently got mine in the freezer chilling, so I'll grab that in a second. Um, I can't pressure it enough to get used to doing stuff like that, guys, because it will really up your cocktail game at home and really enhance your drinks. Get your glassware in the fridge sorry, in the freezer, get your mixing glasses in the freezer. One, it makes making the drink a bit easier, and the colder your glass is, the better your drink is, and it will stay colder for longer, and yeah, just really enhances your drinking. As always, guys, you will need bottles one and two for our first drink. I will explain what's gonna be in these and show you how to make the drink if you don't have these bottles, if you wanna come back and make this drink at a later date, which is actually gonna be quite easy to do because our tips, tricks, and hacks video for this week is actually showing you how to make the homemade ingredient element in this cocktail because it's a super super easy drink guys. You will also need your garnish bag for the first drink guys which has a little bit of cheese in it and then a pickle as well. That's going to be the garnish for this drink. Pickle week, pickles in the drink guys. So yeah guys, grab your mixing glass. Like I said, if you haven't got it in the freezer, don't worry, let's just add some ice to it to get it nice and cold and then let's make this drink. So in bottle number one guys, nice and simple, it is just a nice double measure of Hendrix. Add some in now. So it's just 50 ml of Hendrix. So you can add bottle in, in bottle one, sorry, into your mixing glass right now. And then in bottle number two, what we have is we have a gherkin shrub. 
Uh, like I said, I will explain in more detail how to make this ingredient later on, but essentially what we've done is we've taken a jar of gherkins and mixed it with some sugar and a little bit more vinegar just to sort of lengthen the, the shrub a little bit more and then pasteurize it, which is what I've got here. I've used a classic American style pickle as well, so I've got that lovely sort of luminescent green color to it. So that's just 25 mil going into your mixing glass now, guys. And then we're gonna add some ice to this and give it a good stir. At this point as well, if you are using a teacup, uh, I would add a couple of cubes to that as well. All the ingredients in there, we're just gonna give this one a stir. As you can see, the reason I love freezing our mixing glasses as well is it creates this lovely frosty effect on the outside of the glass while we're stirring it down. Just want to go until it gets nice and diluted. Feel free to taste as you go as well. You know when it's ready when you're still going to get that sort of shrub, acidic, vinegar, pickle flavour with the gin and the sort of dryness and the juniper, but it's not going to give you that alcohol burn from something where it's just pure alcohol. Once it's nice and diluted, you want to grab, if you're going to be using the teacup and saucer, your saucer. Otherwise, if you're going to be using a martini glass as well, guys, no need to add ice to it. Uh, we just do this because of the volume of the teacup. Uh, I've already got my saucer ready with my pickle and cheese. And I'm just going to use a strainer to hold back the ice. And just pour all that lovely liquid into my teacup. Now, if you were fortunate enough to try this while we were running it on our fourth menu and while the bar was still open, we did used to serve our garnishes on a little mouse trap. They were deactivated, but we'd usually spend the better part of a Saturday night watching people attempt to try and reactivate the traps, which wasn't a really good idea. So we thought probably not the best idea to give you all a little mouse trap in the box. So we just gave you the cheese and pickle instead, which let's face it, that's the best bit. So yeah, that's our first drink, guys, the Tour Mouse. So yeah, like I said, this comes from Dr. Inks's fourth journal. That journal was titled Pride and Produce, as the menu was all about highlighting not just local produce found from all around Devon, but also uh, with highlighting sustainability and sustainability practices, and the drinks were all about, rather than looking further afield for ingredients and, and things like that, it was looking at the produce we've got locally, as using local is a great example of sustainability. The more local you use your products, the better, because less air miles, less pollution in the air and things like that. Um, so the uh, the cheese that we used for the garnish uh, comes from the great people at Quicks over in Exmouth. Um, and that's a really popular cheese. And, you know, I see it up and down the country as well, but it's local to us. So we get it straight away. And then the, the shrub itself is an example of, we've talked about this before, shrubs are used as a way of preserving ingredients. Um, so yeah, so we just wanted to highlight that and the simplicity of this drink. But where does this drink come from and what is it inspired by? Well, it's inspired by two different cocktails, uh, the Gimlet and the Gibson. Now, the Gimlet, we've mentioned the Gibbs, uh, sorry, the Gimlet before, but I'll just go into a little bit of the history of the drink as well, because uh, it is a really good fun uh, history and it's, it's sort of one of the first examples of a cocktail that you see before cocktails were a thing. So, the Gimlet was a naval-based cocktail, and by that it was sort of, it was accidentally created, or was created by circumstance. Um, so we knew that the Navy both consumed gin and rum. Uh, the reason for this was that water was spoiled. They didn't have a great way of transporting water on ships. They were transported in, literally in barrels, so it wouldn't last very long. It would sort of go off and go wrong. So a lot of the sailors, so they needed to find a way of hydrating the sailors and keeping the water going, and also keeping the sailors happy on those long voyages because it was a really unpleasant time. So it turns out giving them a bit of alcohol would, uh, would lift their, look quite literally lift their spirits. Um, so yeah, the sort of lower ranking sailors would consume rum as it was considered quite a cheap spirit at the time. Um, and the officers would consume gin, most famously something like Plymouth. And this is why you have Navy strength gins as well. Because uh, also the stronger the spirit, the, long, the more it's going to last, uh, the longer it's going to last on a journey. So where does the gimlet come from? Well, the gimlet comes from the, the sailors, a lot of them were suffering from scurvy. And they needed to prevent this, and they needed to find a way of preventing this. Uh, and there was a Scottish doctor who discovered that uh, citrus helped prevent scurvy. Uh, so they started to try and encourage the Navy to start adding say, uh, citrus into a sailor's rations. This wasn't met with much uh, enthusiasm at the start, um, uh, but then as the scurvy problem got worse, they actually had to introduce it as a as a part of the daily ration for a sailor. They had to have a bit of citrus in their diet. This sort of 
magical citrus fruit that suddenly started to help them prevent scurvy. Essentially scurvy is caused by a vitamin C deficiency and a lot of citrus fruits just have it in there so that's why it worked. Um, we started off with lemons, or they were encouraged to use lemons, but the, uh, the navy being the grafters that they were decided to go with limes instead because they were a fractional bit cheaper. Uh, which is why the Americans gave us the ever affectionate name Limeys. So yeah, so the Navy made a ration of lime juice into a sailor's diet. Now how was this consumed? Well, enter Admiral J. Vernon. Uh, this chap would take the rum ration that the sailors were used to getting at the time, and then not only to lengthen the rum and make it last a lot longer, uh, he would encourage them to dilute it with water. Uh, this was met with a lot of resistance, but it got through eventually. Um, and then he also encouraged them to mix it with some lime juice as well, therefore getting in their citrus ration. And this became known as a grog. Uh, it was named after Admiral J. Vernon's coat that he wore, uh, which was a grockle. Um, not the best joke in the world, but hey, it was it was a sort of inside joke that sailors would sort of use, they were sort of calling it by that name. Um, but the officers were not going to consume rum, they were not going to drink it. It was, as far as they were concerned, they were going to have their gin, it was their high class spirit that they wanted, to, they, they earned to drink. So, essentially they just took gin and mixed it with this lime cordial that they were serving on board in equal parts, and the gimlet was born. Now, where does the name gimlet come from? Uh, it's Essentially, it's the name of a tool that they would carry on ships used for tapping into barrels. It's called a gimlet, uh, and that's where the name comes from. Now, to call this a cocktail is... is mm, it was born out of circumstance, really. It, it, it does work, but if you've ever tried a true 50-50, e.g. equal parts gimlet, so e.g. equal parts gin to lime cordial, mixed together warm, because they had no ice, it's okay, but it's not the easiest thing to drink in the world, but it's okay. Um, Reduce those ratios a little bit, if nothing more for the sake of your teeth, do not drink equal parts of cordial and gin, it will ruin them. Um, reduce the ratios a little bit and stir it down over ice and get it nice and cold, it is a thing of beauty and lime just works well with a gin. It's why most people will go opt for a lime wedge when they don't know what to have with their gin, because uh, lime and gin just work. But this cocktail was not just born of a gimlet, it is also born of a Gibson. Now. A Gibson is essentially a variant of a dry martini. Now, when we talk about martinis in the bar, they are defined by the level of vermouth that we use to uh, gin, the garnish that we put on it, whether to shake it, whether to stir it, and most of the time, this is just an excuse for people to act like idiots in bars and order stupid drinks and think they're cool. Take this scene, for example. Would Sir care for a drink? Martini. Gin. Not vodka, obviously. Stirred for 10 seconds while glancing at an unopened bottle of vermouth. Thank you. It's not cool. It's not the right way to order martini. And most of the time you end up with a glass of cold gin. And I've seen so many times in the bar people struggling through it, thinking they're cool. It's not. It's just not. But a Gibson, to me, is a thing of beauty. It's one of my favourite ways to drink a martini. Um, and the variant is just the garnish. It's just the different garnish that's used on the cocktail and it goes to show how in something as simple as a martini how much the drink can be affected by the garnish that you use. So essentially a Gibson is a dry martini, a gin dry martini garnished with cocktail onions rather than your traditional olives or lemon peel whatever you fancy it uses cocktail onions instead. So where does the name come from? Why is it called a Gibson? And where does the drink come from? Well around the sort of late 1800s to sort of around the 1930s there was a really famous artist by the name of Charles Gibson uh, and he was known for drawing these illustrations of women called Gibson girls. Now, this is still a, it's a term called Gibson girls and you can see the imagery of them still to this day. These women that he drew were not only iconic sketches uh, but they were also renowned for being rather well endowed. Uh, so Gibson was a member of uh, the Players Club. Player... I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> So Gibson was a member of the Players Club, and it was said there was a bartender there by the name of Charles Connolly who made this drink. Essentially, he made a dry martini, a classic spec of, of a dry martini, sort of low ratio of vermouth to high ratio of gin. And rather than garnishing it with the traditional lemon peel, he decided to put two cocktail onions, cocktail onions, boobs, on a garnish pick and put them on the drink. And that's it. That's how the Gibson was born. Circumstance. The bartender was making a stupid joke and actually created a pretty good drink at the end of it. Uh, they use specific uh, onions called pearl onions because they're nice and small. I don't know if you've ever tried to put two onions on a cocktail pick. Use a full size one, it's not going to go very well. So they use pearl onions and put them on a the pick, place them on the top of the glass. 
And that's it. That's the Gibson guys. That's where it was. Uh, that's where it comes from. So yeah, this isn't revolutionary, but what happens? Why did it work? Well, essentially, it's all about seasoning. We talk about seasoning in food all the time. Go to any chef; they'll say the problem with making food at home is people don't know how to season it enough. And when we're getting complex with cocktails, when we're using savoury ingredients or even most ingredients, we never think about seasoning when we're creating cocktails, or at least most of the time people forget about seasoning. And that's what that did. Adding those cocktail ends, there would have been a little bit of the brine left on them, which would have had salt and things like that in it. So as that seeped into the martini, it was essentially seasoning it. Uh, salt, as we know, is a flavour enhancer and a carrier. It will carry flavours you know, to your palate. And there are bartenders who insist on adding salt into pretty much every cocktail they'll make in small proportions, uh, normally in the form of a saline solution, just salt and water, salt water, that they'll add into cocktails to season it as it really does enhance the flavour of your drinks. And this is evident when you think about something like a margarita, you know, we put a salt rim on it, if you do it properly as well, and I'm not talking about like a snowside mountain amount of salt, just a nice thin level of crushed rock salt on the side of the glass, Every time you take a sip, that salt is carrying through some of the other subtler, more subtle flavours you're getting in that margarita. Things like orange, you know, the lime, the tequila, all of that, it's really going to carry those flavours through. It's why salt works so well on a margarita. So yeah, so that's sort of an insight to where we were going with this drink, where the history of this drink comes from, what it's inspired by, you know, and why it works. Why eating a bit of cheese and pickle alongside drinking a gin and a pickle shrub works so well together. It's that seasoning, guys. It's just... Salt makes things taste better. It just does. It's not great for you, but add salt to most things and it makes it taste better. Even sweet things, caramel with salt. Now, I'm actually gonna show you how to make the shrub that we put in this cocktail uh, in this week's tips, tricks, and hacks. All right, guys, so this is this week's tips, tricks, and hacks. Uh, we're gonna be showing you how to make the gherkin shrub from our first drink, the two amounts. Now, for this, guys, what you're gonna need is you're gonna need a jar of pickles, uh, in brine, you can get these pretty much anywhere. Any supermarket will obviously sell these. I've gone for the uh, American style because I love the American style pickles. Some granulated or caster sugar, a non-reactive container. Non-reactive is super important, guys. Uh, plastic, great. Glass, great. Metal, no. Uh, metal and acid uh, from the brine are not gonna work well together and are gonna change the flavor of what you're creating. Uh, some scales for measuring. And then once you've let this sit for a little bit, the next day you're going to need uh, a heat source, so like an induction hob or cooker, whatever, and a saucepan as well. So this is how we make this drink. So this drink, this ingredient, guys. Shush you. So like we've talked about before, shrubs are a way of preserving ingredients, um, and it's great when you work with something that's already sort of preserved in a brine as well, because it really, really works in terms of its flavour. So we're going to start with our sugar, guys. We're going to weigh out around 250 grams of caster sugar into our non-reactive container. Put that to one side. Now, we want the pickles from this, but we don't want the brine just yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to strain off the pickles, but reserve the brine. Make sure you don't throw away that liquid because we're going to put it to use. Remember, this is all about sustainability. We don't want to put anything to waste. So just grab a little drug and use something that you can hold back with liquid. I'm just gonna strain all that out. And like I said, yeah, make sure you keep that liquid and keep the stuff that you get in the strainer. And then we're just gonna add all this to our sugar. Shush. As so, make sure we don't lose any. And then guys, you just wanna pull that brine back into your jar. Screw the lid on and then we're going to come back to that at uh, a later date. So now you just want to take your sugar and pickles and just grab a muddler and we're just going to crush these all up into sugar. Just really get that sugar coated onto them. If at this point you look and you think the ratio of the pickles uh, to sugar is a little bit low, you can always add a little bit more in. As you don't know what to be, you can use any size jar of pickles, they just want to make sure that they're all coated in sugar. Get all that crushed up and mix together. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a lid on this one, we're going to seal it, and then we're going to leave it for uh, 12 to 24 hours just to let the sugar absorb all of the juice from those pickles and really get all that flavor into the sugar. Uh, and then when we come back to it, we'll be left with something like this. As you can see from the inside of the jar, all the 
the liquids come out of the pickles and it's all mixed in there right now. When you reserve your liquid, if you find that, because we're going to be working on the basic sugar syrup making principle of equal parts liquid to sugar, so if you do find you haven't got enough brine from your jar, don't worry, you can top it up with some white wine vinegar so you get to the equal parts. So if you've used 200 to 300 grams of sugar, we're going to want 2 to 300 ml of liquid. So, it's the next day, our shrub's ready to cook and we're ready to melt all that sugar. So what you want to do is, you just want to grab yourself a pan, saucepan, and we're just going to scrape all the contents of our shrub into that pan. Sugar will be a little tough guys, it usually sticks to the bottom, but that's fine. Let's go all of that in the pan. And to make sure we don't lose any of the sugar that we've got in there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab the jar of brine, and we're just gonna add that one into our tub. I've added some white wine vinegar into this as well because it wasn't quite enough. And then just give that a mix around, make sure we get all the sugar off the bottom of the tub. Don't want anything to go to waste. Add that into our saucepan. Now, we're going to put the heat on. Now, with this, guys, keep it low and slow. Keep it nice and low with this, guys, because you do not want to boil vinegar, because uh, that's how you get carbon monoxide poisoning. So keep it low. Let's not boil our vinegar, guys. Um, and make sure you don't do it in a really tight, enclosed space as well. So just, yeah, keep it nice and low. You'll be absolutely fine. So let's just give it a stir. And what you're going to do guys is we're going to stir this until it's, uh, all the sugar has dissolved. Yep, so that's now looking nice and dissolved guys. All the sugar has been mixed in and it's ready to strain off. Okay guys, for the next and final part of our shrub, what we want to do is we want to make sure we've got a sterilised container to strain the shrub into. Um, best way to sterilize your glass bottles at home guys, wash them out with some soap, make sure you get all the soap out of the bottles and then you can put them in a low oven uh, on a low heat till all the water is dissolved uh, and evaporated and heated up and that helps sterilize your bottles as well. But just make sure it's nice and sterilized, that way the liquid inside will keep for much, much longer. So what I'm going to do now is just, I've got a funnel here and a strainer. If you do find that some of the particles after you've modeled it up are really, really fine, you could strain through a cheesecloth. Um, but otherwise the normal sieve will be absolutely fine and I'm just going to slowly start pouring my container, holding back all the solids and there we have it. Nice and simple there guys, lit it up, put it in the fridge, this will last I mean, at least a month, if not longer. Like I said, it, the whole point of this it is a way of preserving ingredients. It will last a very, very long time. Um, make sure to label it as well, because uh, uh, I've made the mistake of not labeling stuff in the fridge, and then I've gone to add a sugar syrup to my old fashioned and realized it's pickle, which isn't actually necessarily a bad thing, but it can go wrong sometimes, depending on what you've got in your fridge. Yes, yeah, so label that one up, whack it in the fridge, and that one is ready to go. So now you can go back and make your own tour mouse as much as you want, because uh, I know over the next month we're all going to be stuck at home with not much to do. So yeah, give this one a go. And it won't just work in in a gin cocktail like this. Try it in lots of different things. It's a real versatile ingredient and it can really enhance some drinks. So yeah, there we have it guys. That is this week's tips, tricks and hacks. What's the best vegetable for standing in line? The cucumber. Okay guys, it's classic time, and this week, while we're not technically serving a cocktail, we are serving a shot-style cocktail, and arguably the greatest shot you will ever take in your life, if you like pickles. Uh, yes, that's right guys, we are going to be doing the Pickleback. Um, it's my favourite shot, it's one of uh, many people I know's favourite shot. It's just such a delicious way of drinking whiskey. Uh, and yeah, it's super cool. So instead of the pouch this week, guys, you'll have been given two little bottles labeled three and four, meaning our second cocktail is five and six this week. So three and four are your pickleback, three being your Jameson, which is the whiskey of choice when taking a pickleback, and then some pickle juice from the people at the Pickle House. I'll be talking a little bit about that product uh, in a bit. 
but the pickleback. Give people a spirit and they will give you a gimmicky way of serving that spirit. Take tequila and uh, people will throw you tequila slammers with that slimy lemon or lime wedge and that horrible table sh uh, salt. The Jägermeister, give them a herbal liqueur and they will mix it with some energy drink for a heart attack inducing Jäger bomb. And then there's the 80s with the plethora of innuendo, double entendre style shot cocktails from your blowjobs to your screaming orgasms to your B-52s and your slippery nipples. It, the list goes on. Everyone looks for a gimmick when taking a shot, but sometimes they get it right and they get the flavors right and it's absolutely delicious. And that's what is, a, that for me is a pickleback. And it all goes back to that thing I've mentioned, seasoning. It's all about seasoning. When you season your drinks, they just taste better. Born out of a would-be dive bar in Brooklyn in around 2005 called the Bushwick Country Club, which is about the most posh name for a dive bar I've ever heard in my life. A bartender by the name of Reggie Cunningham, Cunningham sorry, was eating a jar of pickles on shift to try and get through a hangover he was nursing from a previous uh, drinking night. When in enters one of his regulars, a, as he described it, gold tooth biker chick that was a regular at his bar who took one look at the pickles he was eating and asked for a shot of whiskey, specifically Old Crow bourbon, along with a shot of the pickle brine and insisted that Reggie have one with her. Reggie protested, but like any good bartender, you twist our arm enough and we're probably gonna have a drink with you. So he took a shot with them and to his delight, it was delicious. Uh, and, and he had three or four for the rest of the evening and it actually helped his hangover a little bit. And so the pickleback was born and it became an instant hit in the bar. The pickles in question, they were McClure's or McClure's, I'm not quite sure the name, but it's quite an American, it's quite a famous American brand by this point, and it just so happened it was created by a guy called Bob McClure, who was living above the Bushwick Country Club and didn't have anywhere to store the pickles that he was making and just happened to use the storage area of the bar and gave some to the guys to have a little um, play around with garnish. But yeah, this shot picked up and it went traveled around. It became an instant hit all over New York. And around this time, uh, Jameson was quite a famous shot for people to have in bars. It was a sort of go-to especially when you take things, think about things like St. Patrick's Day, you know, we have somewhere like New York that has such a huge uh, Irish immigration community from when it was created. Uh, you know, an Irish whiskey is quite a popular thing, so it was a go-to shot for everyone. So they switched from bourbon to Jameson. And yeah, cut to about four years after its creation, this shot went viral. Of course, the people at Jameson are gonna endorse it and help it, anything to shift more of their booze. And that's it, guys, that is the Pickleback. Loved all the world over now. In its most simplest form, it is a shot of pickle juice or brine from the jar and a shot of Jameson. And that is what we've given you guys. That is what is in bottles, uh, sorry, three and four. It's very simple, guys. If you wanted to make this another time, grab yourself a couple of shot glasses. You're gonna need 25 ml of good old Jameson in one glass. And then 25 ml of pickle brine, pickle juice, or if you have done our tips, tricks and hacks for this week and made up a pickle shrub, that will work just as well as well. And there we have it guys, that is the pickleback. So now let's all raise our glasses, take a pickleback shot together and toast the hospitality industry because as much as we are happy to be here for you during lockdown, uh, it's really sad to see the bars closed again uh, and obviously we've got lots of friends that work in this industry that are currently not able to work in their bars. So let's all raise a glass for them for all their wonderful hard work in keeping us happy and full of libations, so cheers. Ooh, that's good. So guys, instead of using a brine, I just wanted to cork a little bit of the brand I'm using, and actually they kind of, this brand helped inspire this masterclass because we love pickles and we love pickling things in drinks, so uh, we, I love this product, so I wanted to use it to make a class around sort of savory pickled ingredients and cocktails. So this is the Pickle House, guys. Started in Hackney in London, because let's face it, anything that's kind of cool and hipster is going to probably come from somewhere in London. Like I've said, London is one of the cocktail capitals, if not the cocktail capital of the world. Um, so you're going to find the best, coolest ingredients there. So this brand was started about six years ago by a lady named Florence, Chir Florence Chirot. I really apologise if I got your name wrong there, Florence. Uh, but yeah, inspired by a trip she took to New York, uh, she came back and created this amazing ingredients. So rather than being a brine, this is a pickle juice that has lots of other different ingredients added to it, so it's nice and complex. It still has all that pack of that savory pickle juice flavor, uh, and it's just a great ingredient. Uh, for a pickleback, it works amazing. 
but it works great in other cocktails as well. Experiment, guys. Pickle can be a lovely addition to cocktails, adding in that savory note, as well as, like I said, I'm gonna keep mentioning it, seasoning. You know, watch any chef video and they will talk to you about seasoning to your ears bleed, and they will salt things every 30 seconds. Uh, so I wanna encourage you to start seasoning your cocktails as well, because it really does enhance the flavor. So try it in lots of different things, guys. I've already bought a case for Christmas because I know I'm gonna be using a lot of this and toasting over the uh, season. So they also do a pickle-inspired Bloody Mary mix, which is a perfect segue to lead onto our second cocktail, guys. Now, guys, if you're wondering why this looks a little bit differently, it's totally because the footage of our second drink uh, corrupted and failed, so I'm back in Dr. Drinks a week later filming it now. But who cares, let's go on with our second drink. So yeah, this is how to make the second drink of our masterclass, guys. So like I said, this is gonna be a Bloody Mary. Now, Bloody Marys are, they're great cocktails, but essentially when you think about them, they are boozy glasses of tomato soup. They're literally one of the OG uh, brunch cocktails, the hangover cures, you know, designed to sort of wash away that horrible groggy feeling of the previous night's drinking and the night before that and the night before that, and the night before that, and go on, and so forth, and so forth. And when I say brunch, I mean brunch. The people that order a Bloody Mary past mid-afternoon at the latest are psychopaths. Just, just don't, it is a morning cocktail. Having said that, the drink we're about to make is my way of converting it into an evening. So yeah, like I said, they're essentially boozy glasses of tomato uh, soup, essentially. It's usually a tall vessel. Uh, filled to the brim with tomato, along with some spices, vodka traditionally, sometimes gin, sometimes tequila. Garnished traditionally with things like a celery stalk and maybe sometimes a little bit of bacon, but over the last 10 years, we've seen Bloody Mary garnishes get more and more mental, more crazy, more crazy, till you end up with monstrosities like this. Uh, I've seen this far too many times uh, as a Bloody Mary and it's absolutely mental. But what's even more mental, guys, is I'm going to be showing you how we turn this into this. But before I get into the science behind this drink, let's make it first. So yeah, guys, the great thing about this drink is it's going to give you all of that lovely Bloody Mary flavour, all that spicy, savoury tomato goodness, uh, but you'll get to sip something that has all the sophistication and classiness of a, ma of a martini. Um, so for this drink, guys, what you're gonna need is, you're going to need a coupe glass or a martini glass, that's what we're gonna be serving this drink in. Uh, a mixing glass to stir it down. Um, I've got mine chilling in the freezer, ready to go when I make this drink in a second. And out of your box, you're gonna need bottles number six and five, and then the little brown garnish bag that has some tomato leather in it. If you're worrying what tomato leather is, don't worry, it's quite simple, I'll explain it in a second. So what I've done for this drink, guys, is I've taken the main lengthening element of a Bloody Mary, e.g. the tomato consomme, tomato sauce element, and I've clarified it. Now, how have I clarified it? Well, I'll get to that in a bit, because I'll explain the science about it, because it's quite simple to do if you have the right products. But let's make the drink first. So guys, I'm gonna grab my mixing glass. There we are, it's all nice and frosted and chilled and ready to go with my drink. And as always, guys, you know what you're doing with the bottles, but I'll explain the individual ingredients. Now, rather than doing vodka, which is the traditional uh, Bloody Mary ingredient, I wanted to go something that was gonna add a bit more flavor to the cocktail, give it another dimension. So I've gone for tequila, making this a traditionally, what's known as a Bloody Maria. So I'm using 100% agave blanco tequila. Uh, so I'm just gonna add in 50 ml of that to my mixing glass. Straight in like that. And then I've paired that with 10 ml of dry vermouth, going for that kind of martini feel, but with tequila rather than gin. So I'm just adding 10 ml of that into the mixing glass, and that is what you will find in bottle number five. And in bottle number six, you will find your clarified tomato consomme. So this is how the Big Tom looked when I started, and by the time I was finished with it, it looked like this. And that's what you've got in bottle number two, guys. It's just tomato consomme. So I'm just gonna add 50 ml of that into my mixing glass. That will do the same. Now the thing left to do is add some ice and give this one a stir. So always, guys, get it nice and diluted, all those flavors mixing down, bring down the ABV of that tequila so it's a bit easier to drink. And strain into 
try mixing glass. And then grab your little brown paper bag, and in there you should have a little piece of tomato leather. Place that on the side. That is it, guys. That is our second cocktail of the day. Uh, the Clear Your Mind. Cheers. Now I really love this drink and I can consume quite a lot of them in fast succession because as the sort of theory goes, Bloody Marys are great but one is not enough, two is too many as they're quite viscous and they sit in your stomach as this is something that I can consume drink after drink uh, but still retain all that lovely uh, tomato spice flavour, all that, it just packs a powerhouse of flavour. Now, how would I clarify this? Well, it's, it's relatively simple to do as long as you have the right equipment. Um, essentially, um, I took Big Tom uh, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, spice tomato mixes to use as it has a lot of the spices you're looking for in a Bloody Mary already inside the bottle. Um, and then I added this ingredient called Pectinex. Now, what Pectinex does is it breaks down the solids found within most fruits. If you think about pectin, the ingredient that we use when we're making jam and it's found in jam sugar, what that does is it binds the sort of cellular wall of a fruit together. It combines, you know, binds the solids and the liquid all together and holds it together solidly, and that's why you add it to things like fruit juice when you're making jams, and it thickens it up even more. Whereas Pectinex works reversely. It breaks it all down. So when adding it to something like Big Tom, um, I added it at like a sort of 1% solution. It comes in a tiny little bottle like this. You get about 100 ml, so in sort of, you know, 750 ml of Big Tom, I only added sort of roughly 7.75 ml. Um, so I added that Pectinex into it, and then I uh, blitzed it through a blender just to mix it in and incorporate it through all of the, the mix. I then placed it in a fridge for a couple of hours to let the Pectinex go to work. And what that was doing was it was breaking down all of the solids, spitting them off, and then I just simply poured it through a coffee filter, and then that left me with this beautiful clarified tomato consomme, as you can see. It's still got all the same flavor, but none of the solids in there. Um, and as with our first drink, we were all about zero waste and wanting to not put anything you know, in the bin that we could actually use a bit further. The leftover solids still had loads of flavor in them. They still had all, the, all those spices, um, some of the pickle juice I added in as well from our um, pickle house bottle. Uh, so I wanted to use that. So what is it, essentially I did is I took this sort of leftover, essentially it was like a puree by the end of it. So I removed most of the liquid from it, so it was very thick. Um, and then I just placed it in a dehydrator, uh, put it on sort of around 65 degrees for 12 hours. Um, and it absorbed the remaining liquid in there and dehydrated it down into a leather. So this is actually edible, guys. It is just dehydrated tomato. It's gonna have a little bit of a bite to it, but it's gonna have all of that, it's essentially like a Bloody Mary jerky. Um, and that was the thinking behind it. And I wanted to be yeah, as eco-conscious and as zero waste as I could be with this cocktail. I'm just gonna put that back on the I'm not gonna bother with that one. Yeah, and just wanted to show you some of the cool things that we can do in a bar and when we have access to the right cool bits of science here. And, and it's, it seems quite sciencey, but it's actually relatively simple. All, you know, the, the, the things we use for doing this, anyone can buy uh, from a sort of specialized ingredient website. That's where we get our stuff from. Uh, so you can get a little bottle of Pectinex and go for this yourself. And it can pretty much clarify anything from lime juice, lemon juice, to strawberry puree, raspberry puree. You know, but we, we have fun with it and use it to clarify lots of different stuff. But yeah, it works especially well in something like this, which will give you a mind boggling drink such as this, which is a Bloody Mary in flavor, but nowhere near that in appearance. Now, as always with my stories when it comes to cocktails and where they come from, the origins of this drink are disputed. Uh, there's always one or two stories as when drinks, to be honest, it makes sense. Uh, the older a drink is, the more that sort of the stories, especially of around the time these drinks were created, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have easy access to publish the information. So information gets lost, stories get forgotten. And, and so there's two stories behind where the Bloody Mary comes from. One is that it was created in a bar called Harry's Bar, which was quite literally a New York bar that was moved from Manhattan to Paris. They literally broke down the bar brick by brick and moved it to Paris and then rebuilt it over there uh, to create sort of a American bar in, in Paris. There, a French bartender by the name of Fernand Petois claimed to have invented the cocktail around 1921. Uh, the, the idea being that uh, it was just a sort of, kind of like the gimmick, it was a thing of circumstance. Uh, he happened to be uh, experimenting with vodka. There'd been a lot of sort of Eastern European um, immigrants moving into Paris at that time, and obviously we know vodka came from that area of the world. It's disputed where it came from, Poland or Russia, Russia or Poland. They still fight to it to this day, but we know it came from a roughly around that area. So they were bringing with them this vodka. So Fernand had the vodka and, and decided to play around with it. And he decided to mix it with this tomato juice he had, along with some other spices. 
Um, I think some Worcester sauce was uh, an ingredient he would have added at that moment. Um, and he wanted to use the vodka because it was quite neutral in flavor. It wasn't gonna add anything to the drink. Uh, he wanted to, to let everything else play it sort of as the main flavor component. And obviously it, the name Bloody Mary as Fernand claimed it was uh, given for Queen Mary Tudor. Eventually, Courtois, his Bloody Mary, and his talents as a bartender would travel from Europe, uh, from France across to England. Uh, there, he worked in a few different hotel bars uh, and brought the Bloody Mary with him. Uh, it was around this time, apparently, a Russian prince approached him. Obviously, Russian prince probably drank a lot of vodka, liked his Bloody Mary, and apparently, he gave him the idea of adding Tabasco into the cocktail to give it that sort of spicy hit that you want when you're sort of drinking a Bloody Mary. You know, that's sort of the more common thing that people ask for now is they ask for a real spicy Bloody Mary. But he was working in a hotel bar. Hotel bars have standards. The name Bloody Mary didn't quite meet their sort of level of how comfortable they are with a name. So the owner asked him to change it. And at this moment, they changed it to the Red Snapper. Now, another thing as well is that vodka quite hadn't quite hit England at this moment, or if it did, it was in very small quantities. So they changed it to the next most common spirit used in uh, England at that time, which was gin. And to this day, a gin Bloody Mary is known as a Red Snapper. Now that's Fernand's story. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of credibility with actual, there's some written things here and there, but inside of the actual origin in France at Harry's Bar, there's no actual physical evidence to prove that that's where it was then. The other story is that it was created by a chap by the name of George Jessel. Now, George wasn't a bartender. Uh, he actually was a master of ceremonies in America, meaning he sort of would host big ceremonies and things like that. He actually got nicknamed the Toastmaster General of the United States because he was basically a man that could control a room. No idea why it has to be the title Master of Ceremonies, but it's America, they like their big booming titles. In around 1927, uh, and around and after a, a very, very heavy, heavy night of drinking, he found himself back in the bar that he'd been in on the previous evening, uh, and with only a couple of hours to go until he had an important tennis match with a potential business partner. So he needed to clear his head, he needed to get ready for this, and he needed to swish this hangover as quickly as possible. The bartender at this moment turned to George and said, why don't you try this, this spirit I've got? And he grabbed this dusty bottle off the back bar, and he said that it was a spirit called Vodki vodka, essentially, it was vodka. Uh, George opened the bottle, took one sniff of it, and he said it smelled like rotten potatoes. And so he asked that uh, the bartender give him some tomato juice, some Worcester sauce, and some salt and pepper, and a bit of lemon, threw it all in the glass, boom. He created this drink that was essentially curing his hangover. He took one swig of it, and his hangover was starting to disappear. At this moment, a friend of George named Mary entered the room. Uh, she was also nursing a pretty bad hangover, and she was still wearing her elegant white ballroom dress from the previous evening. I think he could see where this is going. George, in his excitement at this new creation he created, ran up to Mary and insisted that she try this drink. He said, Mary, this will cure your hangover. And, and launches it into Mary's hand as she attempts to grab it, tips the glass, spills it all down her lovely white ballroom gown. Uh, they both took one look at each other, laughed, and both proclaimed that she was now Bloody Mary. Now there is some written evidence to say that George's story is potentially probably the true one. I think there's some articles uh, around that time that sort of quote him as being the person. His mix was always of equal parts vodka to tomato juice, like 25 mil, sorry, 50 mil vodka to 50 mil tomato juice, and that is the 50-50 uh, Bloody Mary. Uh, some recipes vary depending on that one. That's what we've done today. Uh, I really wanted to get all that flavor in there. But who knows which story is true? Um, like I said, with these stories, guys, there are, there are always two sides to it. There's always two different stories. In fact, keep an eye out as next week, Paddy will be telling you through his own personal experience of uh, fighting over the origins of a creation of a cocktail. But regardless of who created this drink, guys, it doesn't matter. It was a glorious cocktail and it went on to become you know, one of the all-time classics. Uh, when you think about a brunch cocktail, everyone instantly goes to a Bloody Mary straight away. Uh, it's, it's one of the go-tos, and you can even go to bars specifically around the world that are Bloody Mary bars. Give them a Google, look them up. They've got these big sort of deli counters just full of all the different, you know, ingredients and garnishes so you can create your own monstrosity Bloody Mary. Personally, for me, I just like it for its flavor, so I'm gonna stick with my clarified one, um, as, yeah, I'm a bartender and I like drinking bartender drinks. So there we have it guys, that's our masterclass on pickles. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, next week we're going live again. Paddy's gonna be stepping in and doing some more masterclasses. So he is going to be taking you all through liqueurs next week. We've covered some different liqueurs so far. We've covered, you know, your Amaro's uh, from Italy, the bitter ones. Now we're gonna be covering some classic traditional sweet liqueurs. Think about your classic creme de cacao's, uh, fig liqueurs, you know, your traditional fruit and chocolatey 
sugary liqueurs, uh, your cremes. So he's gonna be taking you all through that next week. So please head to our website, guys, now where you can purchase that box and get involved. In other news, guys, if you are enjoying these masterclasses and you're enjoying some of the spirits that we use and some of these cool ingredients, um, I'm pleased to announce that our sister bar, Halulu in Timoth, has revamped itself into a, a sort of pantry shop. Uh, and they have got some incredible spirits and wines available now, guys. So if you do live in the Teambridge area, I encourage people only in the Teambridge area to travel there, as we don't want to encourage people to break lockdown rules. But if you are in the Teambridge area, please head to their shop now, where you can purchase some of these ingredients. Uh, we will be stocking stuff that we've used in the masterclasses. So if you do want to recreate these drinks, you can head down there now, uh, chat to the guys at the shop, and they will be more than happy to help you grab some products. Aside from that, as always, guys, it's been a pleasure hosting you this week. I'm hoping you are enjoying these cocktails. Like I said, next week's box, Liqueurs, is live now, so you can go purchase that. Um, as always, stay safe and I will see you next time. Thank you.